Hello, you're alive. Welcome to the Quarren stream. After technical difficulties and computer restarts and figuring out how to use the Zoom as a microphone, we're gonna make uh, VAs, toffee, cookies, except we don't really have chocolate. I mean, we have some Hershey's. Maybe we can use some Hershey's. Hershey's, but we have... got toffee. Yeah. Got all my dry ingredients measured out. We're only doing a half batch because I don't know how this is gonna turn out. Um, and Laura's helping me. Hello. We have sriracha. I don't know what that's for. Surprise oh, later. I don't need that. <laughs> Hold on. Every day, more interesting news. Uh, people's checks, William stimulus checks are being held up for spurious reasons. Um, and actually, uh, people's creditors can just straight up take their checks before anyone even gets them. So if you got debt, you might not see your 1200 or maybe it's just going straight to bills anyway. Um, and I think we had, was it 5 million, 6 million, uh, more people claiming joblessness. We have like two, 22 million unemployed as of this month. So that's fun. So in light of all this, we're going to read some knowledge from Big Daddy Karl Marx. Um, I'll probably get through like a paragraph, honestly, uh, because multitasking is going to be a lot of fun. Right now I'm browning my butter. It's just a stick of butter now. Um, Marx, mostly because it's more meme to say that you're making cookies and reading Marx. Because uh, he's notoriously dry, and nobody says to start with Marx in terms of theory. But it's more fun to say you're going to read Karl Marx and make cookies. So that's what we're going to do. Um, yeah. You want to tell me if the butter's like yeah. ready while I do this? Thank yeah, you. Yeah. But yeah, we got our dry ingredients, cup of all purpose, uh, half teaspoon of baking soda, three eighths teaspoon of salt, and then we don't have vanilla extract, so I'm using cinnamon, a uh, quarter teaspoon, because Babish said it was a good idea. Um, so it's gonna melt, and then once it's completely melted and it starts to foam, yeah, you can, you can move it a little bit, but yeah, once it starts to foam, um, I could start at chapter one, but I'm gonna go ahead and jump over to chapter seven. So this is the, uh, was this the 87 translation? Yeah, not like a literal translation of the first edition, but like an adaptation, one of the adaptations that Engels did, courtesy of Marxist.org. Thank you, Marxist. All right. Chapter seven, the labor process and the process of producing surplus value. Section one, the labor process or the production of use values. The capitalist buys labor powder, power in order to use, there's no labor powder in uh, my cookies. The capitalist buys labor power in order to use it and labor power in use is labor itself. The purchaser of labor power consumes it by setting the seller of it to work. By working, the latter becomes actually what before he was only he only was potentially labor power in action, a laborer. In order that his labor may reappear in a commodity, he must, before all things, expend it on something useful, on something capable of satisfying a want of some sort. Tis done. Oh snap! I came up really quick. Yep. <laughs> Sorry to pause. <laughs> You want it to be round? Yeah. I'm gonna let that go just to have more lower heat. I just wanna see some brown butter action. Let's see. Can you see it? Can you probably can't see it. Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see it? Oh no, no. Can you see it? There you go. It's browning. It's buttery. It's 
This is not a setup for a cooking show, but that's fine. Um, where was I? Okay, well, hence, what the capitalist sets the laborer to produce is a particular use value. Can you make sure it doesn't burn? Yes. What the capitalist sets the laborer to produce is a particular use value, a specified article. The fact that the production of use values or goods is carried on under the control of a capitalist and on his behalf does not alter the general character of that production. We shall therefore, in the first place, have to consider the labor process independently of the particular form it assumes under given social conditions. Labor is, in the first place, a process in which both man and nature participate, and in which man of his own accord starts, regulates, and controls the material reactions between himself and nature. Two reactions between himself and nature. He opposes himself to nature as one of her own forces, setting in motion arms and legs, heads and hands, the natural forces of his body, in order to appropriate nature's productions in a form adapted to his own wants. By thus acting on the external world and changing it, he at the same time changes his own nature. He develops his slumbering powers and compels them to act in obedience to his sway. We are not now dealing with those primitive instincts instinctive we're not now dealing with those primitive instinctive forms of labor that remind us of the mere animal an immeasurable interval of time separates the state of things in which a man brings his labor power to market for sale as a commodity from that state in which human labor was still in its first instinctive stage we presuppose labor in a form that stamps it as exclusively human a spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is this, that the architect raises his structure in imagination before he reacts it in reality. At the end of every labor process, we get a result that already existed in the imagination of the laborer at its commencement. Keep going. Mm. Can you put it under the light? Yes. Keep going. This little one, yeah. I've never cooked like in that small of a space, mm -hmm. but it like super foams up usually. It usually it foams. I just want to make sure it doesn't turn Like if it out. starts to turn brown, then take it off the heat. Okay. Um, but if it's still blonde, it's fine. Okay. Um, cooking. Uh, where was I? He not only affects a change of form in the material on which he works, but he also realizes a purpose of his own that gives the law to his modus operandi and to which he must subordinate his will. And this subordination is no mere monetary act. Besides the exertion of the bodily organs, the process demands that, during the whole operation, the workman's will be steadily in consonance with his purpose. This means close attention. Fairly dark. Sorry. Does it's dark. It, I mean, it doesn't it, look brown yet. No, no, no. That's 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 that's, that's like right before it's ready to go. Okay. So and so make if sure. you're browning Sorry. butter, I mean, some people will say like once it starts turning blonde and it melts and it foams a little bit and it like subs once it foams and it subsides, you're usually good. You usually say not to take it all the way to brown in the pot because it's gonna carry on cooking because it's gonna stay hot. But it's like now it's starting to foam. Yeah. If it gets a touch brown. To me, that's fine for these cookies, um, but it really needs to foam up. It needs to look like you're like uh, in a bubble bath, and then the foam will. It'll take a long time for the foam to subside. You might want to use, uh, like if you see like solids forming, you can use you can use a rubber spatula to scrape the bottom a little bit if you actually see solids forming. But you don't have to disturb it too much. But yeah, it foams like a bubble bath and. Don't get scared, but maybe yeah. turn on, if it happens too fast, maybe turn on the heat. Uh, I'll turn down the heat. No, it's fine right now, I think. I mean, it's already getting... Okay, yeah, if you want to, yeah. It's a little hard to tell this lighting, unfortunately. Hold on, we're going to ruin the lighting real quick. Uh, start, start scraping the sides and the bottoms. 
Yeah. It's just starting to brown. Yeah, there's some stuff collecting at the bottom. You can sort of smell it. I'm going to read like one more sentence and then it'll be good. Okay. Um, workman's will be steadily in consonance with his purpose. This means close attention. The less he is attracted by the nature of the work and the mode in which it is carried on, and the less, therefore, he enjoys it as something which gives play to his bodily and mental powers, the more close his attention is forced to be. The elementary factors of the labor process are one, the personal activity of man, i.e. work itself, two, the subject of that work, and three, its instruments. So a person uh, browning butter and a pot and a stove Yeah, it's hard to tell when it's a smaller quantity. Mm -hmm. But like it's basically clear, so it's like essentially browned. Yeah. Yeah, you can see the solids at the bottom. Okay. They're a little burnt. That's fine. Yeah. Can you see it? 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 <gasps> Alright, at this point, once you brown the butter, pour it off into the container that you're gonna mix everything in. Uh, and you gotta let it cool before you add, before you start creaming your sugar and butter. And I have my dry ingredients already out like I showed off to the side, those will be in at the end. But brown butter in, let it cool slightly because we're gonna cream uh, sugar and then at some point we're gonna add egg. And we don't want the egg to instantly scramble. But creaming the sugar and the butter Creaming butter and sugar just basically means mixing it together until it's fully incorporated. But that process, um, I wish we had an electric mixer because it takes arms. Yes. <laughs> We've done it before with forks. Is yeah, it? now I have an actual whisk. See? Improvement. Yeah. And we're good. You're supposed to, the recipe calls for a room temperature egg, but I forgot to take the egg out, so it's coldish. <laughs> All right. Let's see, what's next? Uh, the soil, and this, economically speaking, includes water, in the virgin state in which it supplies one man with necessaries or the means of subsistence ready to hand, exists independently of him and is the universal subject of human labor. All those things which labor merely separates from immediate connection with their environment are subjects of labor spontaneously provided by nature. Spontaneously. Spontaneously. Such are fish which we catch and take from their element, water, timber, which we fell in the virgin forest, and ores which we extract from their veins. If, on the other hand, the subject of labor has, so to say, been filtered through previous labor, we call it raw material, such as ore already extracted and ready for washing. All raw material is the subject of labor, but not every subject of labor is raw material. It can only become so after it has undergone some alteration by means of labor. An instrument of labor is a thing or a complex of things which the laborer interposes between himself and the subject of his labor, and which serves as the conductor of his activity. He makes use of the mechanical, physical, and chemical properties of some substances in order to make other substances subservient to his aims. Leaving out of consideration such ready-made means of subsistence as fruits and gathering which a man's own limbs serve as the instruments of his labor, the first thing of which the laborer possesses himself is not the subject of labor, but its instrument. Thus nature becomes one of the organs of his activity, one that he annexes to his own bodily organs, adding stature to himself in spite of the Bible. I didn't realize he talked about the Bible. <laughs> As the earth in his original larder, so too it is his original tool house. It supplies him, for instance, with stones for throwing, grinding, pressing, cutting, etc. The earth itself is an instrument of labor, labor, but when used as such in agriculture implies a whole series of other instruments and a comparatively high development of labor, comparatively high development of labor. No sooner does labor undergo the least development than it requires specially prepared instruments. Thus, in the oldest caves we find stone implements and weapons. In the earliest period of human history, Domesticated animals, i.e. animals which had been bred for the purpose and have undergone modifications by means of labor, 
play the chief part as instruments of labor along with specially prepared stones, wood, bones, and shells. The use and fabrication of instruments of labor, although existing in the germ among certain species of animals, is specifically characteristic of the human labor process, and Franklin therefore defines man as a tool-making animal. Relics of bygone instruments of labor possess the same importance for the investigation of extinct economic forms of society as do fossil bones for the determination of extinct species of animals. It is not the articles made, but how they are made and by what, in by what instruments that enables us to distinguish different economic epochs. Epochs? I don't remember. Instruments of labor not only supply a standard of the degree of development to which human labor has attained, but they are also indicators of the social conditions under which that labor is carried on. Among the instruments of labor, those of a mechanical nature which, taken as a whole, we may call the bone and muscles of production, offer more decided characteristics of a given epoch of production than those which, like pipes, tubes, baskets, jars, etc., serve only to hold the materials for labor, which latter class we may in a general way call the vascular system of production. The latter first begins to play an important part in the chemical industries. Riveting. You gotta love political theory. Oh, I see Show's in the chat. Is he still in there? Hello, Show. Are you sneaking over there? Listening. You're listening? Hiding away? Show's in the chat. Oh, hey, Show! I think he is anyway. So the electric mixer is an instrument of labor that was fabricated by the working class in order to extract upon the soil. <laughs> now you're getting it. Mm -hmm. See, uh, Marxist theory has everything to do with cooking and baking. Anytime you make a meal, remember the labor theory of value and production of use value and surplus value. Um, you can, I think you can actually watch the chat on your computer or your phone if you want. What is this on? It's on my YouTube. It's on YouTube, oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. You're working right now? Oh, naughty. He's multitasking. Yeah, multitasking, just like me. Um, <laughs> so at this point, I'm going to measure out sugar and begin cleaning the butter and sugar because I think the butter is actually it's really hot. No, the butter's still really hot. I mean, it's in a metal bowl, but it's still crazy hot. I don't know if you can see it any better in this bowl. Yeah. Just don't get that on my TV. Fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, you're gonna pay for it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You're gonna pay for it. We'll get to that. It's in a later paragraph. <laughs> By the way, uh, Richard, Richard Wolf has like an amazingly simple like summary, basically. He does in his um, lectures or classes or whatever of basically this whole principle in a much clearer and simpler way. But it's, uh, you know, you gotta mainline that Marxist theory. Um, where are we at? In a wider sense, we may include among the instruments of labor, in addition to those things that are used for directly transferring labor to a subject, in which therefore, in one way or another, serve as conductors of activity, all such objects are, as are necessary for carrying on the labor process. These do not enter directly into the process, but without them, it is either impossible for it to take place at all or possible only to a partial extent. Once more, we find the earth to be a universal instrument of the sort, for it furnishes a locus standi, locus standi, locus standi to the laborer and a field of employment for his activity. Among instruments that are the result of previous labor and also belong to this class, we find workshops, canals, roads, and so, so forth. Um, Infrastructure, basically, yeah. Um, in the labor process, therefore, man's activity with the help of the instruments of labor affects an alteration designed from the commencement in the material work worked upon. The process disappears in the product. The latter is a use value. Nature's material adapted by a change of form to the wants of man. 
Labor has incorporated itself with its subject. The former is materialized, the latter transformed. That which in the laborer appeared as movement now appears in the product as a fixed quality without motion. The blacksmith forges and the product is a forging. If we examine the whole process from the point of view of its result, the product, it is plain that both the instruments and the subject of labor are means of production and that the labor itself is a productive labor. Though a use value in the form of a product issues from the labor process, yet other use values, products of previous labor, enter into it as means of production. The same use value is both a product of a previous process and a means of production in a later process. Products are therefore not only results, but also essential conditions of labor. So I turned the brown, the butter into brown butter. And now the butter, the brown butter is the means of production with which we're gonna make cookies. And everyone who eats the, my cookies is a capitalist. I think that's how it works. Um, anyway, I think I'm ready to start creaming butter and sugar. But hey, if anyone else hasn't read Capital or the Manifesto or anything else, I mean, there's a lot of very relevant contemporary analysis and theory. Obviously, history and theory should go hand in hand. But if you got time, read some Capital. Uh, let's see, half a cup tightly packed brown sugar. I've got a whole cup right here. Because I don't want to use half cup measure. Although it's got a little bit of raw flour on it, which is not a good idea. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, when you're making cookies, the sugar is not just uh, for taste. I've had a situation where it's like, oh, I'll like, I can't remember, but I've like had like a little extra sugar in my dough and it actually changes the texture. It's like more grainy almost. So I think it's pretty, if you're trying to be particular about the texture of your dough, you should keep an eye on how you're measuring your ingredients. There's certain things like if you add like an extra like eighth of a teaspoon of salt, like I don't know if, if that's gonna be that big of a deal, but like an extra like eighth of a cup of sugar or something like that, that that'll, you'll be able to tell. Um, so here we go with half a cup of brown sugar and a sixth of a cup of granulated sugar. I should probably actually break out a different cup measure for this. Uh, a sixth of a cup and a third. So half of a third. Third cup. Granulated sugar, which I'll do half of, two for one six, because we're only doing half of the recipe. This is again BA's uh, brown butter toffee, except we don't have that much. We have some chocolate, but not a lot. Um, and now to cream butter and sugar. Oh, this is much easier with a whisk, like an actual working whisk. Instead of a instead of a fork, although I have these huge clumps of brown sugar, uh, you definitely can't see inside the bowl. But you know, fun for everybody. And the milk solids got a little extra toasty, but it's just gonna taste, you know, extra nutty and poppy, right? It's not burnt. Extra depth, extra flavor. Yeah, it's not gonna, it's not burnt. Just gonna whisk. Until it's homogenous and the texture is a little different. It might get a little lighter, although it's really dark. That's awesome. You're doing great. Yeah? Are, oh, you, yeah. are you actually in the stream? Or Probably you doing not. Else? What were you doing? Oh, what was I doing? Oh, I was looking up cutting boards. Oh. Since he just shattered mine. I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, you did. You picked it up and it shattered. Oh. So now I have to get a new cutting board. So now I'm looking at a nice new one that's not going to shatter if I pick it up. You're eating the chocolate. We're going to use that for the cookies. Oh, I thought you were doing your 
coffee. I'm used up. Okay, well, then in here. This sugar will not break up. So. Is it because you waited a while to let the, the butter cool? No, the sugar is just... Because uh, brown sugar has molasses in it, so it... And you're, we're already... Oh, we already no, I'm not using that molasses. Oh, apparently, you changed your mind. Apparently, blackstrap molasses is not good for sweet things. Oh, cool. So I'm just, I just put a little bit of cinnamon in the, uh, the dry ingredients. Cool. Glad you looked at that. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's I mean, why I said I'll only use a half. I mean, it's still sweet, right? but it's like, not all things that come out of trees are going to be like honey, you know? No. Film me doing this, or sure. can you see the can you see the effort in my in my face when I do this? I don't think you're whipping hard enough. It's fine. So I'm using my labor. I mean, you know, you could probably sell a gallon of brown butter or something. I don't know how long you could hold on to butter once you've browned it. Although I don't know how they make ghee, like clarified butter, if they do the same process because the solids and the liquids separate. Don't mind. But if we're talking about, um, you know, the butter has a certain amount of value, and I as a laborer, uh, using my skills and effort, are going to turn it, all these things into cookie dough which would ostensibly increase its value in a market. Although this section alone does not relate to capital. Capitalism is a means of production because just making things and selling them to other people is not capitalism. There's a relationship between a worker and a capitalist that makes it capitalism. But you guys already knew that. Um, it's like a solid chunk of butter. I'm not gonna use that. Oh, I mean, not butter, but sugar. It's like a rock. Okay, I'm gonna eyeball how much that was. I'm gonna say that was like this much, this tiny, and then I'll pin that in. I can't remember if, like, getting air into this really mattered. Maybe it just helped cool everything off, but it might lighten it up the more air you beat into it. But I don't know how much it matters in the final product. Let me take a quick piece of chat. Oh, mix, mix for a little further away. Sorry. I, I forgot. <laughs> I... I'm not watching the chat. Uh, I just I just realized that the uh, mixing bowl is right next to the uh, microphone, so I'm gonna. My bad. Thanks for the heads up. So that was just what well, that was like um, three five minutes of unwatchable uh, content. That's fine. So my, my labor as a worker actually devalue the product. So that disproves uh, everything about Marx and capitalism is actually good. So sorry guys. Um, cool. So now I'm gonna crack my egg and mix that in. And that is going to, the yolk for richness and white for structure, it's gonna kind of like fluff everything up. You don't want your dough to be like runny or anything. You want a good, a decent chew on your cookie. Some texture. Uh, the part you don't want to overmix is. Oh, sorry, I'm right next to the microphone again. Uh, the part you don't want to overmix is the flour, because you start to develop gluten, and that'll make your cookie tough, but once you add the egg in, you can kind of go to town. 
This is actually picking up pretty quickly, which is nice for my arm. I don't know if you can actually see that on the camera. I'm not reading during this part because this takes more focus. If I had like a hand mixer, it would be easier to do. Here, why don't I read a few sentences while I do this? That's okay. Okay. With the exception of the extractive industries in which the material for labor is provided immediately by nature, such as mining, hunting, fishing, and agriculture, so far as the latter is confined to breaking up virgin soil, all branches of industry manipulate raw material. Objects already filtered through labor, already products of labor. Actually, that looks like a decent texture. I'm gonna mix a little more of this. Uh, such is seed and agriculture. Animals and plants, which we are accustomed to consider as products of nature, are in the present form not only products of, say, last year's labor, but the result of a gradual transformation, continued through many generations, under man's superintendence, and by means of his labor. But in the great majority of cases, instruments of labor show, even to the most superficial observer, traces of, traces of the labor of past ages. So, generations building uh, the means of production. Uh, yeah, that looks okay. So... When you add your egg into your butter and sugar, uh, you should beat it until it gets reasonably thick and lightens up in color. I've only done this with a fork before, so this is easier with an actual whisk. So I don't know if it's the right thickness yet. It's definitely thickened up though. Um, raw material may either form the principal substance of a product or it may enter into its formation only as an accessory. An accessory may be consumed by the instruments of labor as coal under a boiler, oil by a wheel, hay by draft horses, or it may be mixed with the raw material in order to produce some modification thereof, as chlorine into unbleached linen, coal with iron, dye stuff with wool, or again, it may help to carry on the work itself, as in the case of the materials used for heating and lighting workshops. The distinction between principal substance and accessory vanishes in the true chemical industries because there none of the raw material because there none of the raw material reappears in its original composition in the substance of the product. Um, it's not getting any thicker, so I'm going to call that done. There are flecks of uh, toasted milk solids in here that I'm sure are going to be great. Um, all right. Oh, sorry for slamming the bowl down right in front of the microphone. Um, so now at this point, I'll add the dry ingredients. Uh, I would not recommend um, adding it all in at once. Um, people say to do that. I think it was like, so you don't like oh, end up overworking it, trying to hydrate all the flour and get everything mixed together. But you can either do one third or just do halves for this small amount of flour. I'm just gonna add half at first. And then I'll add the rest after that's been incorporated. Now at this point, you're not really um, trying to vigorously mix it in. You're going to do what they say, folding in, which just kind of means like uh, gently making sure that everything is mixed together, incorporated, whatever verbiage you want to use. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess we saying about nature, I mean, like a field of wheat, you know, agriculture that's been built up over generations, stuff like that. Hmm. So when you first add the flour, even just half of it, it's going to look like a ton. You're like, oh no, I added too much flour. But it takes a second for it to actually, uh mix in and you want to get make sure you're getting all that flour like off the sides of the bowl into the mix 
And again, once it's pretty much incorporated, I'll add the rest. I don't want to overmix this at this point. So I don't want my cookies to suck. I'm gonna put my the microphone up higher so it's not like immediately where I'm slamming everything down. Thank you, show. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, continue doing your good work. Anyone out there who's still working, um, stay safe. Uh, this is too much flour. This actually is too much flour. Um, I think. Yeah, this is too much flour. Yeah, anyone who's actually still working or out there, I mean, like the construction guys next door, you know, do what you can to stay safe. Um, and everyone should keep these people in their thoughts as we move forward as a society and think about what work is actually essential to keep a society functioning and how we should treat the workers who do that. Um, that's Marx. Okay. The one thing that sucks about the whisk is now that there is this ungodly amount of, of, of dough just trapped in here. It's like half of the mixture. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. This is why I just use a fork. No. The real reason I just use a fork is because I never lived anywhere where anyone had a decent whisk. They were always jacked up. Come on. Get out of there. Let me get visuals on this. Uh, Make sure to get a good Instagram pic. Um, I'll let Laura do that. Um, we're, we're just making the dough today. I like to let my dough sit at least overnight. Uh, allows the flour to hydrate. Let it sit up in the fridge. Uh, the flavors get to know each other a little better and you kind of just have a better dough. Pretty much all I don't, I don't do a lot of baking or anything like that. I've made pizza dough and I've made cookie dough. That's about it. But for the most part, I let it sit overnight or a couple nights. Um, and you'll generally like your product better at the end. Uh, that's the nature part of the means of production, the mode of production. Um, Jesus Christ, there's so much left in here. And I did have to dump out a little bit of flour because it was just a little extra. I split the uh, I split the recipe in half, and sometimes that doesn't always work out exactly. And this, of course, there's always like, you know, are they measuring by weight or by volume? That'll change things. I'm gonna taste this dough. That's very sweet. The cinnamon actually comes too. Which, that's not really what it's there for, but I'm into it. Um, yeah, right now the flavor is not very complex. If you let it sit out, it'll kind of deepen. And then obviously once you bake it, it'll take on a different character. Um, so at this point, your doughs come together. Now you add your filling, topping. Um, and today I have coffee, Heath coffee, and we got some Hershey's Kisses from Easter. So I'm gonna I'm gonna break those up, throw them in, and then we'll pop uh, some saran wrap over the top of this bowl and dunk it in the fridge and then tomorrow we'll have cookies probably because um, I have to leave here on Saturday so I'm eating these cookies I ain't leaving them here alright so 
On the website, they specify an amount of coffee and chocolate, but I always eyeball it. This is the part where, I mean, it helps to measure, but you can just eyeball it. I mean, come on. I'm gonna say it's like a fifth of a cup. I don't know. Quarter cup, less than a little less than a quarter cup. Toffee. The brown butter is our is just kind. Of, I mean, the toffee is just kind of. I don't know. You can say that the toffee is enhancing the brown butter flavor, or the brown butter is enhancing the toffee flavor. Either way, it's sort. You're sort of getting the same nutty, you know, sweetness um, from both of those things. And the little toffee bits in the, in the BA recipe, they call for those like score, like chocolate toffee bars. Um, and you'll get bigger chunks that way. The Heath toffee bits that I've ended up using, they kind of almost like melt away into the dough because they're so small. Um, so you can kind of add just a little bit more than you think. Um, they kind of remind me of like chopped up peanuts. Um, could add peanuts to this, but I'm, I'm not going to because I don't feel like it. All right, how am I gonna add this chocolate? I guess I'll chop it up. So, we got a different cutting board that I didn't break. We got big knife and Hershey's chocolate is nasty and awful and I'm basically making these cookies worse but the extra sweetness will help because there's gonna be a lot of like dark some bitterness and stuff with the toffee and the brown butter and then I'm probably gonna try to top it with some salt once they're out of the oven so the like horrifyingly sweet Hershey's Kiss might actually be nice, but I much prefer a semi-sweet chocolate uh, when it comes to these cookies. We'll start with one, two, three, four, five. And once I unwrap this last one, I'll start chopping and I'll read another paragraph because even though making cookies is the first part of the live stream title, reading marks is the rest of it. <clears throat> okay. So I'm just gonna roughly chop this chocolate and while I do that, uh, raw material may either form the principal substance of a product or it may enter into its formation. Oh, I already read that, didn't I? Yeah, I did. Uh, stuff about chemical properties and shit. Uh, every object possesses various properties and is thus capable of being applied to different uses. One of the same product may therefore serve as raw material in very different processes. Corn, for example, is a raw material for millers, starch manufacturers, distillers, and cattle breeders. It also enters as raw material into its own production in the shape of seed, coal, seed. Coal, too, is at the same time the product of and a means of production in coal mining. Uh, just making sure I don't chop my hands off because I can't go to the hospital. Um, Again, a particular product may be used in one and the same processes, both as an instrument of labor and as raw material. Take, for instance, the fattening of cattle, where the animal is the raw material and at the same time an instrument for the production of manure. A product, though ready for immediate consumption, may yet serve as raw material uh, for a further product, as grapes when they become the raw material for wine. On the other hand, labor may give its product in such a form that we can use it only as raw material as is the case with cotton, thread, and yarn. Such a raw material, though itself a product, 
may have to go through a whole series of different processes in each of these, in each of these in turn, it serves with constantly varying form as raw material into the last process of the series leaves it as a perfect product, ready for individual consumption or for use as an instrument of labor. Uh, hence we see that whether a use value is to be regarded as raw material, as instrument of labor or as product, this is determined entirely by its function in the labor process, by the position it there occupies. As this varies, so does its character. Man. Really nitty gritty. Just, just tell me how to build the guillotines, man. Um, Whether, therefore, a product enters as a means of production into a new labor process, it thereby loses its character of product and becomes a mere factor in the process. A spinner treats spindles only as instruments for spinning and flax only as the material that he spins. Of course, it is impossible to spin without material and spindles, and therefore the existence of these things as products at the commencement of the spinning operation must be presumed. But in the process itself, the fact that they are products of previous labor is a matter of utter indifference. Just, just as in the digestive process, it is in, of no importance whatever that bread is the produce of the previous labor of the farmer, the miller, and the baker. On the contrary, it is generally by their imperfections as products that the means of production in any process assert themselves in their character of products. A blunt knife, like this one, uh, or weak thread forcibly remind us of Mr. A, the cutler, or Mr. B, the spinner. In the finished product, the labor by means of which it has acquired its useful qualities is not palpable, has apparently vanished. A machine which does not serve the purposes of labor is useless. In addition, it falls a prey to the destructive influence of natural forces, iron rusts and wood rots. Yarn with which we neither weave nor knit is cotton wasted. Living labor must seize upon these things and rouse them from their death sleep, change them from mere possible use values into real and effective ones. Bathed in the fire of labor, appropriated as part and parcel of labor's organism, and, as it were, made alive for the performance of their functions in the process, they are in truth consumed, but consumed with a purpose. As elementary constituents of new use values of new products, ever ready as a means of subsistence for individual consumption or as the means of production or as a or as means of production for some new labor process if then on the one hand finished products are not only results but also necessary conditions of the labor process on the other hand their assumption into that process their contact with living labor is the sole means by which they can be made to retain their character of use values and be utilized Labor uses up its material factors, its subject and its instruments, consumes them, and is therefore a process of consumption. Such productive consumption is distinguished from individual consumption by this, that the latter uses up products as a means of subsistence for the living individual, the former, uh, productive consumption, as means whereby alone labor, the labor power of the living individual is enabled to act. The product, therefore, of individual consumption is the consumer himself, the result of productive consumption is a product distinct from the consumer. All right, I've got my chocolate chopped up. I'm just going to go ahead and sprinkle that in the dough. I left it in decent sized chunks um, so you can have, you know, you can see the bite. You want it to melt a little bit. You don't want it just to like disintegrate all the way into the chocolate you want to, or into the cookie. You want to know you're eating chocolate. And if the chocolate sucks, you can avoid a bite that has a big old chunk of chocolate. So it's a win-win. So again, folding the chocolate into the dough, avoiding overworking it because we don't want tough cookies. We don't want too much gluten development. We're not making bread. I'm making cookies. And just as in the previous paragraph, we only make note of the cookies if they suck. 
or I guess in this case I'm complaining about the chocolate so I only think of its purpose as chocolate because it sucks um, I'm pretty sure that's what he means uh, but at this point the dough has come together mixed all my ingredients in Can you see that look at that it's dough I made cookie um, this will probably make I did a half batch. I said I could make a dozen. I forgot because in my head I was doing the numbers and I made a double batch uh, last year in Thanksgiving, which made like 30 something cookies. And so I was like, yeah, the half batch should make like a dozen, but no, it's gonna make like uh, maybe six, <laughs> maybe six cookies, uh, five or six smaller ones. These ones I prefer to make bigger because I get more texture difference between the outsides and the inside, like a crunchy exterior and like a nice, nice pillowy, oozy chocolate interior. But I might have to make these a little smaller just because I did a half batch. But that's about that. Let's see, is anyone actually watching? Anybody in the chat? I have two concurrent viewers. I don't know who you are, but how's it going? Um, maybe I'll finish. I can finish out the section while I'm cleaning up. Yeah, it's a very, very sweet dough. Hopefully these aren't crazy sweet, but I'll be adding a little more salt on top of the final cookie when it bakes. Mm-hmm. Let's see. In so far then as instruments and subjects are themselves products, labor consumes products in order to create products. Or in other words, consumes one set of products by turning them into means of production for another set. But, just as in the beginning, the only participators in the labor process were man and the earth, which latter exists independently of man. So even now we, st so even now we still employ in the process many means of production provided directly by nature that do not re represent any combination of natural substances with human labor. Let me get some saran wrap. Saran wrap over the bowl. Um, there are distinctions between certain things where you have to uh, press your wrap over the top of it so they don't form skin. Cookie dough is not one of those things. Your wrap does not need to touch your cookie. So put the cookie down. See, I have a bunch of freaking raw flour. I'm not going to do anything with that. That's gross. Um, the reason cookie dough is dangerous, raw cookie dough is dangerous to eat. Uh, yes, raw eggs. Are bad for you, but actually raw flour can make you quite sick. I've eaten cookie dough. I've been fine, but you know, stay safe. We are all trying to uh, do our best in that regard these days. Uh, and I hope many of you are sticking to it and taking it seriously, and not being like those jagoffs who are, you know, <laughs> man, it's crazy what. People, what, what, what will and won't get people out in the streets. I will say that getting out in the streets and doing big demonstrations and stuff like that, like they are invigorating and they can be inspiring to a group or a movement. But, you know, rallying in the streets is not necessarily action in and of itself. Uh, depending on, there's a certain effic efficacy um, you know, and I think the right, you know, people talk about Antifa and, you know, literal social justice warriors and the dangers of those things. But a lot of times, like, I mean, there's no, like, Black Panthers or Weather Underground or anything like that. Like, all the 
radical militant leftist groups have been, you know, they've been defeated by the deep state. Um, but the right is genuinely scary and they genuinely commit um, acts of terror, if you will, far more regularly than any reported groups on the left in America. So when, you know, people get on the streets in protest of, um, I don't know, the immigration policy of the country, it's kind of like, okay, that's cute. I mean, not to belittle that, but uh, from the perspective of power, yeah. But a bunch of like bearded people in MAGA hats with their bikes and their AR-15s and stuff like that, you know, that's a little more, I don't know, makes me a little nervous, but these people are literally killing themselves by gathering in mass groups to say, open it up, we wanna die. You know, sacrifice us on the altar of capital, uh, the market breeze as we bleed or whatever. My lifeblood for the market. So, but hopefully everyone else is, you know, if you have to work or, you know, you have to get out there, you're looking after somebody or, you know, Fending for your own and things like that. Uh, trying to keep your insurance, keep your job, keep people alive, stuff like that. Do what you can. If you can avoid pe contact with people, if you can stay inside, continue to do so, please. Um, but I don't remember why, why I was rambling about that. Um, I don't know. But, let's see. Let's read a couple more paragraphs before we close out. Hope you enjoyed seeing me lick dough off my fingers for like three minutes. Um, a labor process resolved as above into its simple elementary factors is human action with a view to the production of use values, appropriation of natural substances to human requirements. It is a necessary condition for affecting exchange of matter between man and nature. It is the everlasting nature imposed condition of human existence and therefore is independent of every social phase of that existence or rather is common to every such phase. It was therefore not necessary to represent our laborer in connection with other laborers. Man and his labor on one side, nature and its materials on the other sufficed. As the taste of the porridge does not tell you who grew the oats, no more does this simple process tell you of itself what are the social conditions under which it is taking place, whether under the slave owner's brutal lash or the anxious eye of the capitalist, whether Cincinnatus carries it on in is tilling... <laughs> Whether Cincinnatus carries it on in tilling his modest farm or a savage in killing wild animals with his stones. Just trying to clean up. I kind of want to like wash everything, but I feel like the audio would be that would be awful, so I'm going to hold off on that. Uh, let's see. Let us now return to our would-be capitalist. We left him just after he had purchased, in the open market, all the necessary factors of the labor process, its objective factors, the means of production, as well as its subjective factor, labor power. With the keen eye of an expert, he has selected the means of production and the kind of labor power best adapted to his particular trade, be it spinning, bootmaking, or any other kind. He then proceeds to consume the commodity, the labor power that he has just bought, by causing the laborer, the impersonation of that labor power, to consume the means of production by his labor. The general character of the labor process is evidently not changed by the fact that the laborer works for the capitalist instead of for himself. Again, the general character of the labor process is evidently not changed by the fact that the laborer works for the capitalist instead of for himself. 
Moreover, the particular methods and operations employed in boot making or spinning are not immediately changed by the intervention of the capitalist. He must begin by taking the labor power as he finds it in the market and consequently be satisfied with labor of such a kind as would be found in the period immediately preceding the rise of capitalists. Changes in the methods of production by the subordination of labor to capital can take place only at a later period and therefore will have to be treated in a later chapter. Cliffhangers, man. Um, the labor process turned into the process by which the capitalist consumes labor power exhibits two characteristic phenomena. First, the laborer works under the control of the capitalist to whom his labor belongs, the capitalist taking good care that the work is done in a proper manner and that the means of production are used with intelligence so that there is no unnecessary waste of raw material and no wear and tear of the implements beyond what is necessarily caused by the work. So, you know, any contract you've had to sign whenever you've taken a job, you know. You will, oh, I'll read the last paragraph and I'll say it. Secondly, the product is the property of the capitalist and not that of the laborer, its immediate producer. Suppose that a capitalist pays for a day's labor power at its value, then the right to use that power for a day belongs to him, just as much as the right to use any other commodity, such as a horse that he has hired for the day. To the purchaser of a commodity belongs its use, and the seller of labor power by giving his labor does no more in reality than part with the use value that he has sold. From the instant he steps into the workshop, the use value of his labor power, and therefore also its use, which is labor, belongs to the capitalist. By the purchase of labor power, the capitalist incorporates labor as a living, living ferment with a lifeless constituents of the product. From his point of view, the labor process is nothing more than the consumption of the commodity purchased, i.e. of labor power. But this consumption cannot be effected except by supplying the labor power with the means of production. The labor process is a process between things that the capitalist has purchased, things that have become his property. The product of this process belongs, therefore, to him just as much as does the wine, which is a product of a process of fermentation completed in his cellar. So, a product has a certain value in, in an inherent state, or whatever state you want to call it, um, in the chain of things. And material plus labor equals a final product. And the labor, basically, if I have a piece of wood, it's worth so much, five cents. If I turn it into a shoe, maybe it's worth 10 bucks. Um, if you have a shoe and you, if you have a piece of wood and you make a shoe and you sell it to someone for 10 bucks, that's not capitalism. Capitalism is someone who owns a store that sells, you know, wooden uh, trinkets and employs, you know, several wood makers that are paid some fraction of the final value or the final selling price of the product that is pocketed by the owner, essentially. Uh, what was uh, the fun example? It's like um, uh, why does you know a bartender pouring a drink? Well, the drink that they pour in those five seconds is going to be sold for more than they make in an hour. I think that was uh, Ollie Thorne or something like that. He said that when he realized that when they started reading Marx or something like that. Basically, uh, the idea of profit is. The margin of profit is what you can get away with between the value added to the product and what you're actually paying to the person who's adding that value, aka the worker. Uh, but I'll stop there, stream for an hour. I made my cookie dough, and now I need to clean. So I'm going to do that. But um, thank you for the some people who watched, apparently. Um, <laughs> I hope I'm not counted as one of those. Thanks, show, for... Jumping in. Thanks, shouts to Laura for helping out. Um, I don't know if that was watchable at all, but I couldn't think of what else to do today. And I'm trying to stick to the schedule again. Mondays and Thursdays at around 3.45, 4 p.m. Uh, I might change the time as things go on. I just have that because it kind of works for this household, which I'm no longer going to be in on Saturday. So there's that. But 
Um, that was Megan Cookie Dough and Reading Marks. Thanks for watching and stay safe. So long. <laughs>